Hello, 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 everybody. I'm Grandmaster Dennis Borsch, and you are watching the Chess Veep channel. Now, this time, we're going to talk about a special topic dear to all of your heart tennis. Why do we love tennis? And why do we love the way Naomi Osaka gives her press conferences? Right? That's the first thing we think about when we think about chess. What's up with Naomi Osaka? And after we're done with that, and realize that she's prolific at that, we wonder, yes, that's true. However, did we solve the age-old problem how to play the King's Indian attack with white? And then the answer will be both no which means we come, we need to come back, think a little about it, and solve it. Can you solve chess? No, you cannot. But some, play, some people tried to do that, which is kind of interesting. Namely, Botvinnik. Botvinnik was one of those grandmasters slash world champions who was thinking about solving the game. And he was kind of using this method of using logic and just being very scientific about the game. Now, compared to other players, he is actually closer to the truth and doesn't really go in the fun sports and chess drama way. And I'm just letting you know, he'd be really upset with the chess drama that's going on right now. Because according to Botvinnik, chess is science. It's not about having fun. It's about being scientific. But it's understandable. He wasn't interested in how to live in the world of chess. Is how to create and then solve that problem. So today, coming back... I am going to do some game reviews and Kings Indian Lecture. So if you have a game review, game to be reviewed, well, there is a game review request in the channel points section. Also, if you're a subscriber, then you are more than welcome to ask away your questions about your games. Yeah, you're saying just computers would solve it. Yeah, but computers, as you might have noticed, are stupid. Not like human stupid. Like stupid in the way they solve problems that are useless. You need to guide them. So it's just like in Star Wars, you need to be the Yoda for all the androids. Because the androids don't know the goal of existence. You need Yoda to guide them to find the direction that they should be aiming at. That's actually the main difference right now between a computer and a human in chess regarding the game of chess. They don't know what they're looking at. They're statisticians, just not human statisticians. Like they're undead statisticians. Yeah, move or move not, there is no try. Exactly. True, never heard it put that way. Nice. Told you, one pocket Slim. You learn every single time you hear people talk. I've never learned anything anytime when a computer talked. Did I? Yeah, no, never. Especially if there's some voice involved. Never have I learned anything. Unless they were showing me something on the computer about chess, which I just plugged in saying, hey, this is my problem, solve it. All right, lots of talk, but let's do better chess. So, let's set up our study, mass studies, and King's Indian attack. King's Indian attacku. Yep, yep, yep. 
not editor not here url yes we're going to start with this game between Petrosian and Ludek Pakman. Do you guys know who Petrosian is? Or why is he so famous? And it's always a good start to understand what's going on. Yoda is the robot, William of Orange. Yoda is the robot. And the androids are Yodas, obviously. Well, may the real Petrosian please stand up. Of course, the Iron Tigran, yes? The world champion. World champion is playing white here, Petrosian. Versus the Pac-Man. The real Pac-Man. Pac-Man of chess. Probably that's all we need to know about Black. He's probably a decent player, but not extra special. Hello, Jempas Lapsudas, how are you? All right. Knight f3, c5, g3. And I do have to stop just for a split second. I'm pretty sure some of you were expecting, hey, we're going to see one e4. But the good part about the King's Indian attack gonna spell that out if you're unfamiliar what this is standing for the King's Indian attack with white is very flexible you can play it with e4 d3 and then transpose back as will happen in many other games we will be looking at or this knight f3 g3 system And that means that with white, you could play two systems, not only one, you could play one e4 and knight f3, g3. Yep, William of Orange is right on the money. Defensive exchange sacrifice. And that's the core of Petrosian. But in fact, Petrosian was a fantastic tactician. Let's take a look. Knight f3, g3, c6, g6. Castle, e3, e4, and voila, we are back in King's Indian attack territory. So first off, we need to decide what is white going for in this position. You might have seen this before. If so, it's not a problem. If you repeat and learn the core concepts that helps you, guide you, if there's this position ever happening. Is e5 possible now? I have a feeling that's not quite a possibility because there's just a lot of defenders there. So rook e1, e5 first. Mm -hmm. Why do we want to play e5? Why is that such an idea that we would appreciate happening? Yeah, we want to shut down the bishop and knight cannot go to f6. Yes, so that's one of those deals that we want to take away space with e5. Good. One concept down. More to go. So one, play for e5. Closing in the g7 bishop. So we've got one idea. But if you want to be methodical, just like Botvinnik is, can we stop right here saying, hey, e5 is the move what else do you want is it the only way to play in this position and sometimes just thinking about core concepts help you 
Who has more lead in development? Obviously, it's white. White has already castled. So once you're castled, that means you get the extra chance to look for other ideas on different sides of the board. Is it legend 27? So you've got to be able to make it work. It's good that you have a plan, but it has to be viable as well. Yeah, so you want to do something about it, but chess is concrete. So whenever you guys mentioned, hey, I want to play e5, and then you came up with the idea of rook e1, e5, that's the way you talk chess strategy. You have an idea of closing in the bishop, and when you do so, you provide a plan as well. You cannot just say, oh, these moves, you've got to make it viable. So one of them is rook e1, e5. Is that the only way to gain space in general? Semi Andoni has a great point, even though it just sounds strange a little bit, but it is actually right on the money. It's not what you want, it's what the position wants to do or wants you to do. So first off, this bishop is a monster. There's a threat on b2. We've got to stop that if we want to go bishop e3, queen d2, cost for blood. So one of those things that grandmasters do is A, identify the problem. B, get rid of your opponent's threats. It's very important to get rid of your opponent's threats. Casper Lod, I think that's one of those things that you just missed out there. You forgot that your opponent is playing against you there, sneakily posting a bishop on g7. So you could go knight e1, f4, but you're wasting a lot of time and you're actually not playing against your opponent. So if you go here, if you go here, f4, a, you're bringing a knight that was perfectly doing fine on f3 to a terrible position and then play f4. Yes, you gain some space, but you played a bad move for a good move. That's not, uh, that's pretty raw deal. H4 is not that big of a deal here. It's always met by H6. And when H5, there's always G5 and black is doing fine over there. Okay, so we had this idea of rookie one E5 blocking in this bishop. How else can we block in that bishop? And what will be the plan associated with that move? Yep c3 d4 that's the other plan just blocking this bishop and then Cosper, you can then do this plan of queen d2 and bishop h6 but you always have to take a look around what's going on yes kane exactly or sometimes knight c3 and then bishop b3 Queen d2, but that's more like a close Sicilian way of play. So I don't really recommend this one, Gosper. Even though this is possible, this is not recommended because this can run into potential d5, d4 
forks and we don't want to get forked ever, right? That'd be bad. Hey, Eliab. So the most normal way is playing with c3. However, Petrosian is one of those players who are famous for the good old King's Indian ways of playing. So he goes rook e1 instead. It's Petrosian Pakman. Rook e1, and he's going to go for e5. And probably Pakman makes a big mistake here. Maybe big mistake is too much. However, goes castles. And in hindsight, probably not the best idea. Should have gone d6 just to cover that e5 square. But he castled. Why is this such... A terrible idea from Ludek. Well, because of e5. And one of those little deals in chess that needs to be remembered is the following. Once you set up a plan, follow through. It's like a tennis shot. You hit the ball and you follow through with that hit. I even have a tennis racket and I'll show you. So you don't just hit the ball. Don't just hit the ball. You follow through with it. So you just make a full sweeping motion. Same thing with chess. You start up with the idea and then you make the move. All right. So e5, following through, just a good chess player would do. Yep, he is trying to kind of freeze these bishops. And if he could, he would go bishop f4, just stopping that d6 break. d6, obviously, I've got to take, queen takes d6. And we're going to stop here yet again. Critical position number two. So... What did black achieve? Black achieved a lot. Black is actually threatening to go e5 and activate this bishop. Also, this bishop is a monster on the long diag. However, we have potential targets in black's position. Where can we find those targets, dear viewer? Yes, 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 yes. The c5 pawn is a big target. Sebastian, thank you for the follow. So we identified the weakness. Now we need to find a way to attack it. Why would you want to bring the knight to e4? Hmm. Okay. You see many, many ways you guys want to get closer. However, I'm curious which one would you choose in a normal game? I'm going to ask you this question. In a poll. It is a poll time.
So what strategy would you use? <clears throat> a4, a5 does not contribute to the idea of attacking the c5 pawn. So that is out of clue question. Also, I mentioned you always have to be vigilant about this bishop. That's why you can't go bishop e3, because then the b b2 pawn is just falling. You always have to check out your opponent's threats. Gosper is saying knight d2 e4 provides a nice outpost for the knight and may harass the queen as well as the pawn. So we're talking about either this way of hitting the queen and pawn or going this way, get a nice outpost or this way, hitting the pawn. Now I see knight d2 e4 won the hearts of the chess players. So exactly correct. Knight d2 was played by Petrosian. And I can tell you one single reason he would exclude knight a3 instead of knight d2. Because knight d2 achieves all that knight a3 can do. So if you go here, it is abundantly obvious you're going to play knight c4 next. If you play knight d2, this is way more practical because there's threats of plenty, meaning you can go all three ways. Alberto Romera, thank you for the host. So in this case, you still have to react to three different concepts. Well, yeah, but your bishop can't really move anyways because it has to defend the b2 pawn. And it only does it temporarily. La right, William of Orange. So now Pacman had to deal with all of these options which is good in a practical game. Queen c7, just dropping back, and here comes the question where to go. So whenever you're trying to decide where to position your pieces, you've got to think about your piece activity and which pieces of yours is out of play. Which one of your pieces are terrible? I see knight e4, knight c4, knight f1. The bishop on c1 is pretty bad, correct, Wakanda? But again, you guys are missing one important point. Why did we play knight d2 the first time anyways? What was the whole point? Why did we go here? Maxens, yes, in the King's Indian attack there are some ideas that we love, but that doesn't mean that in every single position there's only one solution. Plenty of other ways to play this position. So you played knight d2 because we wanted to attack the c5 pawn. The question is, how can you maximize the activity of your own pieces? Whoa, Kasper Lod, thank you for gifting a sub to Squeb Penep. Welcome. Okay, that again pulls out for a pull.
<clears throat> These are, by the way, important questions. Questions that grandmasters ask themselves. So if you go e4, you hit this pawn. But so does knight b3 hit that pawn. So in this sense, they both hit the same goal. However, it has a little bit of a difference. And I'm going to explain that difference. Knight e4 looks like Fisher did against Shervin. That's a good point. However, chess is a concrete game. Knight e4 won, but sadly, knight e4 has won a downside. If you go knight e4, b6, this would look dangerous, right? Why? Because I have a bishop potentially harassing that rook on a8. However, because that knight is just in the way, there's just too many knights in the way on e4 and f3, it is just not great. I'm going to explain lots of variations of Alberto Romero this session. Knight b3 instead though. So knight e4, the problem is there's b6 and we don't have time to exploit the fact that rook is misplaced. So knight b3, hitting the pawn, the same idea. However, after b6, a, we get this bishop active, and we actually have some big threats over there. Knight d4. You don't want to play b6 because in this case, you have bishop f4, e5, but this time, e5 is punished by knight takes e5, and the a8 rook is hanging. This wouldn't be possible if your knight would be on e4. These are those little differences that makes a really good player, such as Petrosian. So you played knight d4. Bishop f4, and now everything works as clockwork. You put pressure on the queen, there's an issue on the c5 pawn. Many, many problems. Queen b6. And again, you're at odds how to continue. So we achieved a lot. We put pressure on the c5 pawn. We've got two very good bishops. But there's one more piece that just doesn't function as well as it should be. Faryasov, thank you for the follow. <clears throat> so you always have to look for more ideas in a position we already have a good bishop on f4 but how can we get a beautiful outpost in this position because this knight actually isn't having such a great time Well, you don't know, forget about it. That's fine. Knight can go to e4 or c4. Yeah, but you've got to decide where you want to put it. Now, whenever you decide 
which way you want to go. Whoa, dead heat. I mean, Queen D2 is fine, don't get me wrong. This is fine connecting the rooks, but it is just a typical move that doesn't really do that much. So knight e5. Why knight e5? Because there's a juicy outpost on c4 and that kind of combines well with threats on d6. This bishop gets even stronger and you also have threats on the c5 pawn. Probably you should refresh Cruzo. That's one of those reasons. You miss it, I think. Knight b3, knight c4, and here he's getting the knight in there with time to put pressure right there. Knight c4, queen b5, a b. Obviously, you take towards the center and you get pressure on the a pawn and b pawns. Now, bishop d6 is a threat putting pressure here, and knight d6, bothering the queen and the bishop. a5, just trying to stabilize. So now we can safely say that white is better. But is white winning? Is white winning here? White is not winning. You've got to put more pressure. That's how you do it. I love it when people say it. Well, it's 0 0.4. Look, we're not machines. It's like saying, hey, I will give you a quarter of a quarter of a day vacation. Does that mean anything? No, you either get a one day vacation or none. There's no quarter of a vacation. So in this sense, zero plus four is ridiculous because it means it's a quarter of a pawn. But what is a quarter of a pawn? It's nothing, nothing. Okay, maybe Geary would do like a dance, but do we really want to see him dance? So where do we see the targets in black's position? Where are the targets? Meaning loose pieces. Where are the targets in black's position? So there's one thing that I want to clarify as Wakand is mentioning one thing. Rook a8. Can you ever reach that rook on a8? Can you reach that rook? No, you cannot. Is that a target if you can't reach it? No. You only have a target if you can reach it, meaning you can attack it. If you can't attack it, it's not a target. Okay, I guess you guys love polls. So there's one more poll going your way. Maybe later. So you can attack the a5 pawn or the e7 knight. One of them is a bit more beneficial than the other. And here, the move is bishop d6. Why? Because not only it hits this knight on e7, it also hits this pawn on c5. 
No pull yet. No pull yet, people. The bishop d6. Attacking the knight and the pawn. And jackpot is the best thing in chess. If you can do attacks of two, that's the best. Bishop d6. Bishop f6. Now, yes, black managed to defend the e7 knight. However, more targets. We've got more targets. In f3. Yep. Immediately pouncing at that weakness. And that's again a sign of a true champion. You always want to attack loose pieces. And that's a loose piece. Can't go knight f5 because it's pinned. You lose that rook. And that would be sad. So Pakman plays king g7. Now. Here comes the big question. Should we focus our attention on the a5 pawn or just stay on course with the f6 bishop? Ah, Knight E five. Mark sense. I don't know how that makes sense. Thank you for the follow, Megamats6969. I know it's a tough question, but chess is a series of tough questions and then someone resigns. That's the truth. So, if you want to focus on the pawn, you have to find a way to attack it. If you want to focus on the bishop, Look for a way to attack that one. So is it legend 27? When you go h4, how does that relate to this a5 pawn or f6 bishop? And that's actually how you can gauge how useful that move is. Does h4 bother that bishop on f6? Not just noticing it. Yeah, it's there, but it doesn't do anything. Same thing with the a5. Does it do anything with it? Also, Max sense in chess, you can only make one move at a time. You'd go like off a Larsen style. Okay. So we want to get, as I see, from the love of the bishop. How can we attack that bishop? Note that this bishop cannot move because it's defending that e7 knight. Well, g4 doesn't really do much. If you just go g4, g5 I will always take, so you just basically pass. How can you build pressure on this bishop? Okay. All right. That again, I promise you this won't be something that happens all the time. But this time it'll be.
What should we do? Should we bring the knight over to attack the bishop? Should we bring a rook? By the way, you can try and go ahead play rook a4, rook a1. Probably would win the pawn, but a piece is juicier because it's three pawns, not one measly pawn. Bishop can't move, that's correct, remote. That's why you want to use that fact. And rook e4 with a knockout. Rook e4. Very strong move by Petrosian. Petrosian is trying to attack and once that bishop is attacked then the e7 guy is hanging rook d8 trying to kick out this bishop however this will be the end my friend the end why not h4 because h4 is slow that's why Rook f4, but note that if you play rook f4, there's knight f5, and you don't have any threats on the f8 square anymore. So if you go here, there's knight f5, and Pac-Man moved the rook away, and there's nothing you can take there. Also hit your bishop. So that ain't that necessarily easy. Hello, Chesteroid. What? Why you guys want to give up the queen? Why? G4, bishop e7. Works? Like, how does it work? Okay, and I just move the king away, cost per blood. Yeah, if here, you take, I take, and go king g5. So in chess, there's no pointing at fingers, <laughs> is the legend. You have the position, whatever you have. h4, uh, maybe. Now h4 makes zero sense. You just go, went rook e4, queen f3. You put pressure on the bishop. Put pressure on the e7. You were bringing the rook in the game. So there's a natural flow to this game of chess. You always got to notice that, that there's a natural flow. All right. Go time, people. Why to move and when?
And it's kind of funny that Petrosian is kind of labeled this boring world champion. In fact, he was one of the most brilliant ones. Boom! Queen F6. Right, Limit Twitch. And yes, that is the big idea. What the heck? King takes f6. Bishop e5. King g5. And the king is trying to run away. question is if the king can run away if it can then I don't know what's going on so we go rook h4 I have h5 and the king will escape this way so if you check I just go back you have a draw but that's not what you want I have the king to run away. So you've got to stop me from somehow running away with my king. Well, h4 actually helps me go that direction. Yep, the bit twitch did find it earlier, but bishop g7 is such a brilliant move by Petrosian. He's just taking away those squares, and there's just a mate that he's setting up. What is the big mate threat? Hello, Trevis. And try to give me more moves than one. Hey, Chess Genius. You came in the right time, Chess Genius. Because this is Genius by Petrosian. Yep. <laughs> so... You always have to look for the best defense, by the way, for black. So knight f5 is one of those best defenses. How can you checkmate after knight f5? f4, and if I go king g4... Well, yeah, my king doesn't enjoy it. Stay on g4, but I will still take on g3 instead of being mated. Yep, knight e5 check, king h5, and bishop f3 checkmate. That's kind of a cutie. Limit to which we got it. We've got it. You said that. 50 billion times, we've got it. Bishop f3, checkmate. That's taken, this is taken, that's taken. And it's rare that you actually checkmate with pawns and pieces. But that's not the only question. I have one more question and that is e5, trying to bring in my bishop. I'm pretty sure that Petrosian saw that this is winning after queen f6. Did he see that? So, okay, disclaimer. Grandmasters like to pretend that they've seen it already. 
No, they didn't see it. They realized that maybe after Rook D8 or just before Rook D8 that that's a possibility. Did they foresee the future? No, they don't see into the future. They just understand the situation. Lots of times it's just a show off that they say, oh, I saw it on move two that I'm winning with checkmate. I mean, they did calculate it and they did find it. However, they didn't know that it will happen. <laughs> oh, Mircha, the best, the beast. Thank you for rating with a party of 61. Hope you had a great stream. Um, I don't know if you remember me. I do remember you. Mircea uh, Parligra. I hope I didn't butcher the name. Also shout out to Mircea the Beast or the Best. Um, I did actually play you long, long time ago in Budapest in a Grandmaster tournament. I think it was some sort of a Sveshnikov. So by the way, if you don't know, Mircea is a 2650 Grandmaster from Romania. So do check him out. We're just looking at some Kings Indian games, Kings Indian attack games. This one is Petrosian Pakman. And we're going to look at some fabulous games as well. Hey, Neil Deal. Hey, Krishna. So here, there's an easy, easy win. Mr. Pac-Man, yes. So here, the big move is h4. You can't go anywhere here. If you go king f5, bishop h3, checkmate, which is not too ugly. And king h5, bishop f3, bishop g4 only move, bishop takes g4, checkmates. Yep, drunken soul, correcto. So even though people underestimate the capabilities of Petrosian, this queen takes f6 sacrifice is quite beautiful. And especially this quiet move. King takes check here. Bishop g7 is just fabulous with these mating ideas. All right. So it is time to look at a game from the King's Indian attack I'm sure you've never seen before. Another one. Exactly, Moxens. It's coming. Are you ready for another brilliancy? Did I play that game? No, it wasn't me. Was not me. All right. So the game two is by Vasyukov, whom you might not know. Vasyukov was actually a brilliant, brilliant player. So, e4. And I mentioned earlier on, but I'm going to reiterate, in this case, you can do it two ways. So knight f3, d5, g3, and you can still go knight d2, e4. So here, here, e6, d3, and you do transpose back to these typical, typical King's Indian attacks. Thank you for the follow, Ink JJ. So, who is Vasyukov? Vasyukov is a legendary Soviet Grandmaster who has a fantastic score 
against Tal. I think he beat him 3-2 in their personal record. Well, you don't have to go anywhere else because I will explain. And I actually understand and know how strong Vasyukov is. Vasyukov is a legend who never really made to the top but was always known for his fantastic tactical play. As we, will sh we shall see pretty soon. To play d4, e6, d3, and in this sense, the king's Indian attack is something that's well worth learning. Stack, stack, thank you for the follow. Why? Because in the king's Indian attack, you can play with e4 or you can do this knight f3, g3. And in that case, you know two lines with white, not just one. William of Orange, thank you for the follow. d5, knight d2, knight f3, c5, bishop g2. And this is the main line, tabia position. Black is going to play on the queen side, while white is playing on the king side. Queen e2. Now, queen e2 is a clever little move. What's the point about queen e2? The point is... White is preparing the attack and supports this e5 move. b5, e5, changing, kind of pushing this knight away and also making sure that there's enough defenders of that e5 pawn. So the move order was the following. This was one e4, d3, knight d2, and then they transpose back to the king's Indian attack. e5, knight d7. So here, now we need to find a good plan. So c3, d4 before pushing e5, that's a completely different position, mock sense. The bishop was on g7, remember, in the Petrosian Pokemon game. And that makes a big difference. Now c3, d4 actually helps black attack you. And if there's a hook, as we so say in chess, there's much easier play on the queen side, which normally doesn't happen. So this time you can go back to your pet plan, mock sense, and go knight f1, bishop f4. Yes, knight f1, h4 b4, bishop f4. Notice that in this setup, white makes sure that e5 pawn is over defended. So let's stop here again and evaluate potential plans for white. There's actually two or three of those big plans. And they can be very dangerous if black does not know what's going on. By the way, this game is played between Vasyukov and Ullmann, the legendary German Grandmaster. So you can go h5, h6, creating a mating net on g7. You can go knight h2, knight g4, and there's a third option that Vasyukov is going to use. Actually, it is sort of like a transposition, not quite. Yeah, this is a Fisher favorite, but Vasyukov was also pretty good, as you shall see. No, g4, g5 doesn't really work. You don't have the time, and you're also taken away this nice outpost for your knight, which can be very useful for your attack. Bishop a6, knight e3. So that's kind of a different way of playing. You can go knight h2, knight g4. However, 
Knight e3 sets up a nice little tactical trick of knight takes d5, which often works because the queen is in x-ray of that f4 bishop. Renaton, thank you for the follow. Knight e3, a4. So he doesn't take, because if he does, takes e6, there's bishop d6. And after the exchanges, e d, queen d7, White actually exchanged off all of his attacking pieces. Renato Maragno, thank you for following. Also, thank you for the anti-tilt. So he doesn't want Black running him over with b3. So he plays b3 himself, just stopping this b3 break breakthrough. Rook a7, and as we notice, knight takes d5 would be a little early. Setveli, thank you for the follow. So we need to create and probe Ulman's position. How can we probe Black's position? So it's always good to kind of get extra ideas in. Now we learned this knight f1, knight e3 maneuver, but then you can go back to number one. You don't always have to look for something original, people. Sometimes the good old plan is good. Bishop h3 is interesting. But you've got an age-old plan. That works, so why change it? h5 you're going for h6 and setting up potential mating ideas on the g7 square good old alpha larsen plan famous for mr bent larsen rook a8 h6 g6 now in these type of positions you often think that hey why is this so great? Well, in the near future, if this queen ever gets to g7, it's checkmate. And I know that seems like a far-fetched idea. However, some creative grandmasters use that as in the future. That might actually give them a win. And it did for Vasyukov as well. So it's Vasyukov to move. And when probably not winning quite yet, however, it's getting very close to crashing through. Knight g4, all these ideas make sense. Stake, stake. Knight g4 makes sense. You want to defend and you want to play bishop g5 and that's good. You want to get rid of this bishop and that's the thematic way of winning the position. However, you have something stronger here. Exactly, Moxens, not g4, g5. Have I ever played against Firuja? Yes, Sorab. And in fact, I did win a couple of times. Although, to be fair, we only played online. Never did we play in live board games. So never played OTB against Firuja. Boom! Knight d5. Very, very strong sacrifice. Which wouldn't quite work if it weren't for this g7 square. ED, now you have to play the critical move, which is of course e6. 
opening it up queen d8 and now here comes the big punchline tnt's duke thank you for following so if e takes then there's just rook takes d7 and it's not quite clear if you're breaking through who's my favorite world champion um yeah unfortunately bronstein is not a world champion um who is my favorite world champion um i guess i get have to go either with fisher or kasparov it's kind of a dead heat between the two gabriel ungurano Fisher, go for Fisher. I mean, it's close. Yeah, I mean, Fisher is amazing with his uh, results. Like, those 6 0 wins is just legendary. So, boom! He takes f7. And again, there'll be some issues for this king. Now if you take here, as I said, rook takes, or even just queen takes, and everything's well defended, black is not even close to losing. So e takes f7. If king takes f7, just check, and you lose the knight, and there's a big raging attack. But Ulman is confident, plays king h8, and seemingly everything is fine. But is everything fine? So this time you've got to figure out something. Whenever you're sacrificing, you've got to look for mating patterns. Thank you for the follow, Saifi Alexa. So what is the mating idea here? Can anybody explain to me? Thank you for the follow, my back hurts 94. Whoa, nope. Nope wins with just for charm donating channel points. Nice. Yep, 95. And the big idea is, you are going to get made at a brutally. Just terribly, if you don't pay attention. Knight takes e5. And... What's the move here? What did Vasyukov play? Boom! Queen takes e5. I give it one exclamation mark. However, it deserves two. When do you see this sacrifice? The problem is if you take, take, here, takes, takes, rook, check, you don't have that move, and the Awful Arzen Pawn takes away that crucial square. Rook takes e8. What? No. 
They're just trying to run away. Rook takes e8, f e8, rook, queen, rook f8, checkmate. Look at that. That's not ugly. But that's not the end of the deal, people. This is just the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So queen takes e5. If you take with the bishop, there's probably bishop f6, takes knight takes f6, and that square is protected. So queen takes e5 was a big move and a very important one. Because in this case, takes, takes, and I have this idea of luring your queen away, because otherwise this would be checkmate. And then rook e8, as we saw before. So queen takes e5 was a key move. Bishop f6. So let's continue. It's not the end of the road. Still some road to take. So let's focus on this game. It's not over. Mr. Ohio, thank you for the follow. Okay, Queen E8 check, of course, but I'm going to just move my knight away. Knight F8. Just thinking that I blocked everything, nothing bad can happen in this position. However, that would be foolish to believe that. Fortunately, I don't think was a big adherent of this opening, with white at least. So what are the mating ideas in this position? We already kind of looked at it. Where will the mate probably land? Yeah, if you play bishop g5, I just take it. You go here, I just take it, and I go back. Go here, just back, and there's no checkmate. Now, there's one important rule when you're following and concentrating on these positions. And that's important. And I'll be very honest with you. You're down a piece, you're attacking. Can you exchange pieces then? No, never. Only if you're 100% sure you're winning. Not in this position. If you start exchanging, you're not even close to win. Also, if you take, take, this pawn is hanging. If you go here, Ulman in the nick of time takes that pawn and the king will escape via g8. So that's not good. Therefore, bishop e5. Point is, you can't really take there because bishop f6 is checkmate. No, we're not up material. We're down a piece. One, two, three. One, two. We're down a piece. So we're actually struggling by the count. Not really struggling too hard, but we're still struggling. So bishop e5, queen b6. Now, queen is defending that bishop. So it seems that everything is fine for Ulman. What is it? You got to keep rolling. Hello, Arzenix. How are you? Also, guys, if you would be interested in future lectures, just feel free to check us out on Discord. Also, sub and follow if you enjoy this. Well, you can't quite take the knight, it's defended. So seemingly Ulman did do everything to hold the fort. 
Question is if that's the truth. Mega Maid says, no, 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 no. I understand that. Renato's asking, can I ask when are you asking Everted? So I'm saying that when you're attacking, you should try to avoid exchanging pieces. Or checkmate. To clarify, in this case, Queen E8, Bishop F6 is a good exchange because it's checkmate. But other than that, you don't want to get those exchanges. Huh, you're saying to yourself, okay. Yeah, so sometimes if you don't see anything better, just take the pawn. And as we do in this channel, we have the greed sign. Everybody spam the greed or emotes that shows the greed. So sometimes if they give you free pawns, take them. Bishop takes d5. You're also threatening to take on a8. The rook can't take because we would promote to another lady. Note that we couldn't really go queen e7 even if we wanted to because the a7 rook is guarding those squares. Yeah, of course the queen is one of the strongest pieces. Yes, Renato. Rook d8, I mean rook c8. Rook d8 would have been an option as well. He plays rook c8 and Olman thought that he's chilling. But nope. Nope, bad count on your part, Mr. Ullman. Why to move and when? Yep, chess is a complicated game, Koval and Potatoes. I don't know what you expected. If you go bishop c6, probably I can take you. Queen takes c6. So whenever you're going for the attack, always look at potential mating ideas. Bishop e6, yes, cutting off the defender. You can't defend that anymore. And not only that, the c8 rook is hanging. Multiple threats in this position. Yeah, this is the lecture, Mr. Lobby. Indeed it is. Well, there are many ways to attack just for the charm. However, you want to be as swift as possible. Rook e4 probably makes sense, but bishop e6 is almost winning on the spot. Bishop e6, so you can't take, 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 bishop f6. Knight g7, h takes g7. Isn't that a pretty pawn mate? I mean, you can always obviously choose between mating, like there's three mates, but h takes is still the one that takes the cake. Bishop e6, but Ullman is still fighting. He takes bishop c8. Bishop d6. Bishop takes. Rook takes. B a. Rook a7. Rook e6. Queen c7. Rook e1. 
c4 and Ulman kind of felt that hey that's defended I don't see mate on e5 on f6 but here Vasyukov wins the game in style the third time So at the moment, if you go here, I take, take, and the queen takes. The rook is defending the queen, the queen defends the knight, and the queen defends these key squares. So that's not the solution. And it's not that easy. So if you go queen f8, bishop f8, to take, I take back. So there's many, many nice ways to attack. However, there's only one clean way, which Vasyukov did fine. Again, a little bit think about this. Where will be the mate? Where do we have the mating concepts? And I'll be back in a split second. Try to answer that question and that will find you the answer. So one of the things is the back rank, but the other one is mating ideas on this diagonal. So indeed, rook takes d6, yes? The point being to lure pieces away from that knight. Queen takes d6, what's the next move? You talked yourself out of it. Yeah, that's one of the things you should never do. Yep, rook e6. Very pretty. And because if queen c5, then there's rook c6 or d4. Probably both is winning. Because you do not have time to defend that f8 knight anymore. And if you take it, queen takes f8 checkmate. It is very similar, yes. So after rook e6 resigned because this mate is unstoppable. Take care, forget about it. So what the other option was here and rook c6 and then the queen has to move. Actually then there's maybe queen e7. And that is probably lost after rook c8. But the cleanest is probably just d4. Takes and queen f8. Checkmate. Which is very pretty. How far did he see in this combination? Probably he saw like uh, 
Queen takes e5, but he didn't see till the end. Pretty sure not, Coronity. And there'll be one more. Yeah, this was pretty, right? G3x. All right, so one more game where we will see Ullmann face off with the real goat of that time. Yeah, he did go oh man. And this time he will go oh man yet again because he's facing the legend Botvinnik himself. Yeah, Ullmann was defending quite well. E4, and we do see this way of playing. And even though you don't associate Potvinnik with aggressive attacking play, he was a very good attacker. D5, knight D2, same line, rook E1, E5. Now, we did like queen E2 a little bit better because it does keep the option of sometimes taking on D5. Well, because you were probably late, G3x, because we just saw before how Pac-Man lost against Petrosian. So e5, knight d7, knight f1, you're going this direction over defending that pawn. One of those typical ways of going. d5, h4. Bishop a6, which is not ideal. Normally you want to have pawns in front, just like this knight, and the pieces behind it. This bishop is actually not doing too well over there. Knight h2, b4. So this time you guys will have some fun. Because in this case, you're actually looking at something or a game where the knight is not on e3, but on h2. Bishop f4 over defending. So this time, as the knight is on h2, we have to look for a different sort of a plan. How else can we attack in this type of position? If it's not the usual h5, h6, obviously, if Botvinnik would be doing that, I wouldn't be asking that question. Knight g4 is a way. Or you can go bishop h3 and knight g5. And you can go bishop h3, knight g5 plan. What does knight g5 achieve? Viewers, any ideas? What's the point of knight g5? Yeah, it allows sacrifices on e6, but there's a second one which makes it really good. To open up the h file, how dritti? Pressure on h7, how are you going to put pressure on the h pawn? Because by in itself, the knight is not enough to break through. Bishop b5, bishop h3, d4. Let's say queen b6. Or, yeah, or let's say queen c. Let's go with queen b6, knight g5. Here, you even have this sacrifice and then winning that knight because it's a check. But if they don't do that and they notice that this is hanging, then there's a typical idea in this king's Indian structure. Only fact, bot. Thank you for following. And this one's very important if you're planning to play the system. As I said before, not only do you have threats 
On e6, there's a second plan involving knight g5. Not everything's a sacrifice, people. Sometimes you have to prepare sacrifices. Queen h5. Very strong move. Pressing on h7. If they take, we take with the h-pawn and then we're coming in on the h-file and usually this is checkmate. So you can't really go that way. Thank you for the follow arrow in the knee. So instead h6 and this time show composure. Composure is important in this case. Knight f3, yes, yes, but the wrong knight, Kasparov, no, this knight, You're going back. You don't have to, but in this case, you will have the plan and the hook to play against. So you will have bishop takes h6 and knight g4. And knight takes h6 ideas, and it's more than likely to be a mating attack. Then understand the other moves are shown by the computer and the computer wants to win at all costs. But sometimes you can be just strategic if you don't see it. And this is just winning. This is a winning attack. Why would you sacrifice anything? And that is one of those deals that you learn from grandmasters. They ask the question. Okay, would you sacrifice a piece with not knowing the consequences or just go for the other line where you're just winning? And they'd say, okay, I'm obviously going for the only line that's winning easily. Yeah, Boogie Max is correct. Requires less calculation. You just have a devastating kingside attack. And that's it. You just go for that one. Anyways, this didn't happen, but that is a big plan of Botvinnik. That does look like a big attack. Should be five, should be h3, c4. Ullman is trying to get counterplay, but Botvinnik gets the chance and closes the position. In b6, bishop b3. Why did he play bishop b3? Because knight g5 would run into queen d4 or knight d4. Therefore, he's stabilizing first. And that's what grandmasters do really well. They stabilize first and then they go for action. Rook c8, knight g5. Here comes the attack. Knight f8. So now we come to a critical position. Very, very critical position. Everything's defended. This is defended. The h7 is defended. But there's a third way to go through and attack. Should we continue with the attack over here? Notice that that knight is actually holding all those important squares.
Reiterate. Queen h5, there's always g6. Actually, you can go knight d8 too, defending that pawn. And remember, knight on f8 does protect all the vitals. And then black can hold. Barely, but can hold. g6 actually would be weakening this square. So probably knight d8 was Ulman's idea. So f4. It's time to roll. As all of these pieces moved away, there's nobody guarding the f5 square. Knight d8. Rar f5. Takes, bishop takes f5. Knight e6. Queen f3. Eyeing this pawn. If knight takes d4, there's some problems with this move. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with knight takes d4? Because knight, knight d4 is a little bit uh, tricky, not ideal. Slow motion, I'm not sure that's a move. Just boom, take, take, here, here, queen h5. If they would go queen h, oh, there's, this is hanging. They can just go take here. And this is simply winning. Yeah, bishop takes h7 is just winning. In fact, I was lulled into that trick. This is not winning because there's bishop g5. And that's not good. So Botvinnik, even though you think he's a positional player, he does set up some nice little tactical tricks. Knight takes g g5. How should we capture back? Bringish, thank you for the follow. Well, obviously, take with... Which way should we take it? With the pawn, of course. Mostly because you want that file for your rook. And if you can line up there, then you're crushing. Rook d8, knight g4. Knight g4, knight g6, king g2, bishop d7. That's a defender. You're going to exchange that. Rook takes d7, rook h1, queen e6. And here comes the last critical phase. We need to find the last important plan. And then we are near crushing through. Plan. Plan, Moxen's plan. Not a sacrifice, a plan. Get the rooks to the h-file. Yes. A typical, typical way of playing. Getting all those rooks up there. Don't sag the you-know-what. Go for the h-file and mate that other guy. Again, it boils down, you want to win and potentially just give away the advantage when you can just go the strategic way and then sacrifice when you're 100% sure you're winning. That's the Botvinnik way. Rook b6, knight f8. We have everything's on the line. Our rooks are happy. These rooks are happy. That's a target. What else would you want? What else would you need? Well, now you are ready. Everything's on the line. 
Now you can do it the Botvinnik way. Open. Yes, Labib. Let's open up the king side. Yep. Knight f6 check now. Why now? Because we already have all our folks over there. And we are ready to checkmate. Question is, can we take, take, no, I don't think we can do that. Hmm. But this is very close to crashing through. Yeah. Knight f6, gf. Can also go the long route. Here, here, bishop g7, rook h7, rook h8 is winning slowly but surely. But Ulman didn't want any of that. Actually, he did. But instead of going d8, he took ef. Queen e4, but this position is already very bad. Takes, takes, rook g5, rook c5, trying to take the pawn. Go down there. There's some issues over here. Rook f6, check, rook h4, and now he's going to, as Pac-Man, collect all those pawns and just win it. King g7, rook e4, rook is coming down. K6, rook takes c4, rook b7, d5, rook b4, rook b2. And he thought that everything's fine, but everything is not fine. Because after bishop d4 check, it's game over. Because after you move the king, bishop takes b2. So Ulman resigned. We actually looked through some wonderful games. From Petrosian to Botvinnik to the legendary Vasyukov. And I hope you guys enjoyed trying to understand the depths, the love of this game and the love of the king's Indian attack. So if you want to look at any of these lectures, check out our YouTube channel. And also, before I go, you're going to raid a channel thank you for the follow remote it is not private it is public so let us see Let's raid him. All right. Really hope you guys enjoyed this. Do check us out on our social media page. Florke, nice to meet you as well. Saw the channel. Hope you had fun there. So I really hope this helped you, invigorate you, love that King's Indian attack. And in general, I think it's something that is worth learning trying out you can get some blistering attacks cost for a lot i really hope you enjoyed this one it was specifically kind of one of those things that you enjoyed also one more thing before we go i did have a match not long ago against komsky so you might want to check that out and i analyze those games It was a 10 game match. That should be fun. All right, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out. Take care, all.